Welcome to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld, and this program is about the evolution of consciousness and where we're moving to as a evolving civilization, as a civilization that's moving more towards the realm of what spirit is, what is the next step in this plan of human development. And I think there's no one better to address that subject than today's guest, Ralph White, the founder of the Open Center and the author of this beautiful new book called Jeweled Highway, which is a story of your very interesting life, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, going back from the Open Center, I didn't know you were a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> I should say I co-founded the Open Center. Right, but, uh, with Walter Beatty. With Walter Beatty, yes. yeah, yeah. You kind of went out to the world without really a vision of what you wanted to do. You had a feeling, but talk about those early days. Well, I was one of those children who from very early age, maybe from eight or mm -hmm. nine years old, was basically going around asking, why are we here? What's the mm -hmm. point of all of this? And, and the standard answer, well, you know, you get a job, you get married, you maybe you have children and you die. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem enough. Mm -hmm. So I was a searching child from a very early age. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the point? Why, is there any point? I mean, I was a sort of uh, teenage existentialist, I would say. I really, I did not come naturally to, I had to go through a long journey, and that's what my book, The Jeweled Highway, yeah. is about. It's about my own personal quest to mm -hmm. find meaning, to find a deeper order of spiritual reality, mm -hmm. uh, and then to do something about it, uh, mm -hmm. to actually uh, work to create centers like the New York Open mm -hmm. Center that have really fostered a more holistic and ecological worldview. So you were there in the uh, foundational beginnings of a lot of these centers. Yes, at the beginning, not right at the very beginning of Omega, but when Omega found its own, because it was originally an offshoot of the abode of the message, right. the Sufi community upstate New York, uh, but when it found its own home mm -hmm. uh, in Rhinebeck, where it has been now for the last 30 odd years, yes, I ran the programs there in the in the first uh, two summers in Rhinebeck in the early 80s. So, And then, of course, starting the Open Center from scratch. I know. Uh, so, yes, and then in Scotland, you know, beginning the h whole branch of the uh, Finthorn, really, mm -hmm. uh, which is today, uh, you know, an echo village and a holistic mm -hmm. learning center in the north of Scotland, beginning the, the branch there called Clooney Hill. Right, so you weren't just looking for a meaning, you, you found purpose. Yes, this, yes, that's right. And, and your life's purpose has been about bringing people together uh, in a level of consciousness and awareness. Yes, that's exactly right. What was the moment where you realized this was something that was your purpose? But there's a chapter in the book mm -hmm. called Hitchhiking to Machu Picchu. Right. And uh, which is something <laughs> I did when I was 23 years old from Canada. <laughs> and uh, it was after I'd, I had been in Machu Picchu, I'd been in Lake Titicaca, I'd been a couple of months up in the high mm -hmm. Andes. And when I came down again to sea level, Mm -hmm. um, and I saw Western industrial civilization with fresh eyes mm -hmm. after being under those starlit skies with those vast vistas. Mm -hmm. uh, I could see immediately, even though it was only in the form of a, a, a city in southern Peru, Arequipa, I, could, I had an immediate intuition, you know, one mm -hmm. of those immediate direct knowings yeah. that Western industrial civilization, as it then was and still is largely, mm -hmm. Um, was damaging or destroying, damaging our souls mm -hmm. and destroying the environment. Absolutely. And that we had to create an alternative. So I would say that was the summer of 73. <laughs> that was a long <laughs> time ago. So I would say that what that's what gave me the clear sense that we must create an alternative. And then it took me a little while to get a sense of what that alternative might be, mm -hmm. you know, the more holistic, ecological, spiritual worldview that the centers I've been involved with have really advocated. Well, I'm really I'm glad you got out of South America. I was reading uh, those yeah. chapters <laughs> about South America. It's like, yeah. oh, I hope he gets out of it. I mean, of course you have, but it's like you know, the, the, mm. the, the intensity that you write these mm. um, experiences mm. with, was it a recapitulation of your life in a sense? Like, you know, going back, because you named the towns and in Tibet and it's all through South America. You're an incredible mm. world traveler. Mm. But to get the specifics of this, did you sort of relive those moments? 
Uh, I think I'm just blessed with a pretty good memory, you know. Oh. So can I, I? I can actually remember the, it all pretty distinctly. Amazing. Um, so it's not a massive effort to recall where these things happen. And when you have a deep soul experience like mm -hmm. the one I just described, mm -hmm. or where, whether you're in Machu Picchu, or whether you're in Tibet, or in the Celtic world, which I described, mm -hmm. where I was born, you know, yeah. which I describe as kind of the Tibet of Europe, because mm -hmm. you're out there. Th it's a similar level of mm -hmm. contemplative peace. Uh, those kinds of soul experiences, at least they stay with me mm -hmm. you know I mean they're, they're there for life yeah so my they open you to that yeah, yeah right so my task in writing the book was really to just to try to describe as meticulously as I could mm -hmm. what those soul experiences were because mm -hmm. I, I can still recall them vividly what they were and to create a uh, community so other people can have those as well yeah that, that's well that's what the open center yeah. and then other places that I was involved with Omega mm -hmm. Institute mm -hmm. upstate in New York and mm -hmm. Findhorn in Scotland yes they're all involved. They're all yeah. centers of holistic learning in and a way. Esselin you mentioned Esselin here Esselin in Hollyhock. Well, there's, and there's a chapter in the book yes. called The Global Network of yes. Holistic Centers. Most yes. people don't know that many of the holistic centers. Well, I know because I live day to day. Yeah, you do. <laughs> but uh, we all, we, we know of, well, yeah. a lot of us know each mm -hmm. other and we're very mutually supportive mm -hmm. because we all recognize that uh, we're part of a larger whole. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. mm -hmm. No, no, I'm just curious. What's happened now? So this was the ideal of the 70s and 80s and there was a movement towards spirituality coming out of the 60s, yes, of course. Yes. And it may have peaked. I mean, it's now, of course, everyone knows yoga. There's massage. Right, is now an okay yeah, thing yeah. to do. And yeah. um, what's happening now? What's the landscape of this community consciousness world kind of situation? Is it change? How is it Well, changing? I'd say that the main change I've noticed is, is really what you mentioned, that it's it's moved into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. When I look back on when we started the Open Center, mm -hmm. I started working on it in 83, we opened it in 84. Mm -hmm. Um, the conventional wisdom was, get out of here, it'll never work. Mm -hmm. um, this is New York, this is the real world, maybe that kind of airy-fairy spiritual stuff will work in California. We can see that isn't true now, you know, Whole Foods is the biggest grocery store. Yeah. In those days it was just little mom and pop health food stores, right. you would remember this. Right, right. And uh, meditation was considered a fancy word for sleep, <laughs> and now mindfulness <laughs> is everywhere. <laughs> So I think it's it's been it's the progressive mainstreaming of this mm -hmm. that is so is you know back in those early days as I was creating the programs, every time the phone rang, would it be a Tibetan Lama who just got mm -hmm. out of Tibet? Would it be a shaman who just came out of the Amazon or his representative, of course? Or some charlatan selling Yeah, snake well, oil. that's <laughs> it. I used to call them holistic hustlers. There was no shortage of holistic hustlers in New York right. in the 80s. They may well still be. <laughs> right. But uh, yeah. so it was fascinating. In those days, mm -hmm. there was a massive explosion of consciousness. And whether it was body workers from California or, or some new branch mm -hmm. of psychology, this was going on all the time. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was a, a time of dispensation or revelation, you might mm -hmm. say, in which new ideas and new practices poured into the culture. I think now we're at more at a moment of integration into the culture. That's why the Open Center has moved to doing more long-term six-month certificates, oh, I see. many of which, not all, but many of which help people mm -hmm. in their professional lives. Do you have a sense of satisfaction like saying, okay, now it's mainstream, we're becoming mainstream, that you've that you've contributed, is that, yeah, do you feel that? Yeah. Like you, well, yeah, I mean, you know, it was. It seemed 30 years ago a kind of quixotic fool's errand. I mean, yeah. are, you, are you kidding? Starting mm -hmm. a holistic center in New mm -hmm. York City, get out of here, yeah, as yeah. many people said. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, you, you see it everywhere. I mean, 300,000 people approximately here, attendees have come to the Open Center mm -hmm. in that time. So uh, yeah. yes, it, it feels it wasn't just some weird little trip. You know, I mean, I mentioned in the book, you know, when I left graduate mm -hmm. school, Mm -hmm. and went off to the West Coast to really explore the mystical, spiritual, esoteric mm -hmm. worldview. Was I really on the path to enlightenment or was I on the path to psychosis or were yeah. th was there any difference? Yeah. I mean, all those questions that I had in that actually lonely, isolated time mm -hmm. because it was pioneering. Um, those have all been validated. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm going to be giving a reading at the bookstore that appears in there, the Banyan bookstore in Vancouver, oh, right. which is when I went, I left graduate school and I went to Vancouver and I was, I was really, I was broke and I didn't know anybody in Canada. I was just on my spiritual path and a tiny little bookstore, just a literal hole in the wall, it just opened around the corner three months earlier. Uh, by a guy, it was opened by a guy who just got back from India and that now is the main consciousness bookstore in Vancouver and that's 
Joshua be appearing 44 years later. So Beautiful. it's, you know, it's sweet. It feels like a karmic turn of the wheel. It feels, yes, it was the right thing to do. I mean, people said at the time, you mad to be leaving graduate school and so on and going off to a country where you don't know a soul. And, but yes, it feels like the, the, oh, the overall trajectory of the journey has been worthwhile. And it has <laughs> been worthwhile. Yeah. It's been not easy, yeah. though. You've oh, God, suffered no. oh, those yeah. cold nights mm. in the Himalayas and the Andes. <laughs> I mean, you're an amazing spiritual adventurer. Well, I've you? always, you know, ever since I was mm. a teenager in the north of England, <laughs> I, uh, I always loved hitchhiking. Mm. You know, I, I can still remember being <laughs> 16 years old and sticking out my thumb. And when that first truck stopped, wow, yeah. I, now I'd say like a rush of Kundalini <laughs> energy, an incredible <laughs> rush right up my spine, an ecstatic rush. Freedom. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I was a teenager, I didn't have any money. So I got around by hitchhiking. Right. And, um, and of course, I always wanted to hitchhike till the end of the road. So hitchhiking from Vancouver down the Pan-American Highway to Machu Picchu. Was That's a, a great was, story. Uh, it was a, a way to do that. So, yes, I've always had a taste for adventure. Right. And also the adventure, though, led to this inner journey, though. Yes. That's the real adventure. It was a spirit because it was a spiritual quest yeah. as well as a physical, ad geographical adventure. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, it was stepping onto that jeweled highway. Yeah, the you jeweled know, highway. What exactly do you mean? Yeah, talk about well, that. Well, you could say it's a metaphor for th the path, mm -hmm. you know, for the journey towards greater levels of consciousness mm -hmm. and enlightenment. But with the jewel, you know, there are facets of the jewel, and it's oh. not sparkling all the time. Oh. And there are times where it doesn't catch the light and it's dark. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, it felt to me it was important to put in the book the, mo the difficult moments yeah. that you mentioned there, yeah. uh, the times where it wasn't clear to me what was coming up next. The time where I was uh, confused, uh, isolated, because I didn't want people to feel that it's just a breeze to do right. this stuff. You know, you just click mm -hmm. your fingers and you, and you do it. No, you, you, you take lots of chances. You worked hard. I mean, yeah. you're talking about those early days with the Omega mm -hmm. um, Institute, finding mm -hmm. that new place mm -hmm. and, and the rats and the, you know, <laughs> all that <laughs> stuff that you cleaned uh, up. Yeah. You, did, you did the hard uh, work. Mm, that's right. <laughs> and it paid off I yeah mean, not just for you but was there moments where you felt so lost and you didn't know which way to turn and 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 what guided you in those moments of, of not knowing do you feel well what did guide me I think it was just uh, a fundamental conviction that had arisen in me uh, through those journeys mm -hmm. adventures spiritual explorations in the early 70s a fundamental conviction that uh, life was inherently meaningful yeah that uh, a path would open eventually that I had a destiny greater than weeding people's gardens and cleaning people's houses, <laughs> which is what I was doing in <laughs> Berkeley after I left Findhorn and before Omega <laughs> opened up. Uh, I, so it was, it was an, I guess it was an inner spiritual conviction that things would work mm. out. Yeah. You, you held to a sense inside you, yourself. You, you went inside. Yes, and, and yes. Felt you. And, and then what did Steiner, reading Rudolf Steiner, do to start to evolve mm, you? Mm. Yes, well, Rudolf Steiner has been a significant figure to me for the last 30 years. You know, a man who we think of him today as the founder of biodynamic agriculture mm -hmm. and Waldorf education, the world's largest independent approach to education. But really, he he gave 6,000 lectures mm -hmm. compiled in over 300 books, which are a treasure trove of esoteric wisdom. Mm -hmm. So what Rudolf Steiner did for me, he deepened my esoteric worldview. You know, it, what, it, what did you actually, what was this, the actual thing you, he deepened it, but how? What did you get? He gave me a clearer understanding of karma and reincarnation. Oh. He gave me an understanding of the subtle bodies, mm. because really karma and reincarnation can't make sense unless you ex experience us as more than just these earth suits uh, right. that, that degrade as soon as they're left to their own devices. Um, <coughs> He gave me a sense of the evolution of consciousness, mm -hmm. which is clearly something that you're deeply involved in. And what I loved about Steiner is that he's, he has a beautiful intellect. He's got mm -hmm. one of the, the biggest mind I've ever come across in the 20th century. So he has a beautiful, uh, uh, comprehensive intellect. <coughs> he also has a beautiful, noble, and very pure part. Mm -hmm. And he's extremely practical and engaged, engaged with the world. I've always been a very engaged person. You know, I've always been very engaged with social, political life, etc. 
Um, and so he was a very practical person. Mm -hmm. That's why his profound esoteric philosophy has been translated into these kinds of practical initiatives. Well, practical, but so mystical, yeah. so connected to these. Yeah. Other. I mean, I actually find him a little difficult to read because uh, it's yeah, a lot of it's, people it's do. Dense. Um, it's it is dense. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I just um, I'm a sucker for it. You know, <laughs> I, I just so well, it, it took you a long time though. You said to yes, to, to I was in it. my mid thirties yeah. before I'd already started the Open Center before I came to Steiner. Mm. And I'm very glad about that mm. because I do think there can be a shadow side to getting into a particular spiritual or philosophical teacher too early because then that person then comes to dominate your life right. and your and Steiner is so comprehensive that you can slip into uh, the whole world that's all about anthroposophy mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Steiner whereas by the time I even encountered him I'd already explored many different spiritual paths yeah. and of course that's what enabled me to do things like at the Open Center and Omega because I was attuned to the whole multiplicity of spiritual and mystical mm -hmm. paths. Well some people say putting all those different traditions together waters it down somehow but I think we give us a chance to evolve culturally I mean what do you say in response to that well I say we're living in a time where well first of all we're living in a world city New York yes. where I've always felt it's the open center's mission to really bring the mystical traditions mm -hmm. the coherent mystical traditions from all of the cultures mm -hmm. here we're living in a time when the whole world is coming together mm -hmm and a time of world spirituality, right. not just east-west spirituality. Right. And I think we have an obligation. It's good for us to tune into other paths than the one that we grew up in. We may select one mm. that is our primary mm. teacher, but uh, I think, you know, you can run the danger of a kind of a new age or holistic mm. fundamentalism, right. just like every other form of fundamentalism. <laughs> it's never a good idea. You want to be open. <laughs> mm. No, we want to be open. I uh, love the open. I was there at least in 86. I remember mm -hmm. Jose Aguayas yes, giving his first sure. lecture in New York. Oh, and, really? Wow. And talking about uh, the 2012 <laughs> date then. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. 2012, that's going to be amazing. So, I mean, in 86 at the Open Center on Spring Street, wow. I attended that lecture mm -hmm. and, you know, set me off on a course, I uh, could oh say. Really? Uh, not just that yeah. lecture, but I was starting to look at many traditions, but the Open Center was the foundation in New York for this kind of world view, this new yeah, emerging world yeah, view. Yeah, yeah, that's been our function, really. And it's been very valuable. Yeah. But now, looking at your perspective from your history and what you've seen, where are we going? Yeah, we're integrating more of this, but how's the world look? You know, there's still a um, environmental hazard, the still rampant fundamentalism. How does it look to you now as consciousness? Where are we going? What does the future look like? I, well, I, I think it's a struggle. Yeah. I think it's a struggle for the soul of humanity. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons I live in New York and America because I think this is one of the major seats for the struggle for the soul of humanity. Yes, we have these regressive impulses like yeah. fundamentalisms. You know, look at ISIS. Yes, what do we do? So How do we open them up to I think we just have to look for openings. We have mm. to see who's receptive to this more holistic way of seeing things. Yeah. Obviously, it's not those people. Yeah. They've chosen, at least for this moment in their mm. lives, a different path. Mm -hmm. Or whether it's, you know, Rudolf Steiner talks the primacy of economic values in all mm. spheres. You know, corporate globalization, mm. where everything is all about money. Exactly. Uh, there's a piece in today's New York Times about how universities are just turning into corporate bastions. Everything is and corporatized. And they're a waste of time anyway. You go to a university, yes. you have to then leave and get a job. I mean, so that's right. Something so that so there are these regressive mm. impulses like fundamentalism, uh, some of you know pure scientific mm. materialism, not mm. science itself, yeah. but scientific materialism. Um, and so we have to be aware that those regressive impulses are present in the world. We don't want to be blind to them. No, we have to acknowledge they exist, of We course. have to acknowledge they exist, uh, otherwise you wind up with a naive worldview. Mm -hmm. But we have to keep on going with our own work of mm -hmm. fostering consciousness, promoting consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way that the Open Center and other centers have done it, we put it out as broadly mm -hmm. as we can. And those people who hear, who resonate, who are ready for that kind of worldview mm -hmm. will respond. And of course, that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. So that uh, more people could 
become aware of this alternate way of seeing things. With b and you see, I mean, I do take the view that the holistic and ecological way of seeing things uh, actually carries the seed for the healthy future of humanity. It wait, really wait, does. Wait, let me, it's, what do you mean then? Say that again. Well, a way of the, the holistic, all the holistic yeah. stuff that's going on in the world now, all the ecological stuff right. uh, responding to global warming yes, and so on, sustainability. Um, you know, an open-minded spirituality, yeah. non-denominate, well, yes. it depends on your choice of denomination. Of course. But all of these things, they actually represent the healthy human future. Yeah. And that's why they're catching on, mm. instead of being fringe phenomena when yeah. I first started out with this stuff. Because uh, they actually provide the answers to where we need to go. Exactly. It's, it's why Andrew Weil and Dr. Oz are on TV all mm. the time. Mm. And it's why uh, countries are finally embracing, because of the imperative of global warming, something to do about creating a more sustainable and green planet. Yeah. Because uh, many of us have been arguing for this for 40 years. Mm. So I think we, we just foster that. We try to get out there and communicate with mm. as many people as possible mm. about it. Mm. And I do think the Holistic Learning Center is a great vehicle mm. for this. And we do what we can to show people there's an alternative to that regressive fundamentalism and materialism. No, I'm so happy you're still so passionate about this work yeah. and, and in what you've yeah. done and what yeah. you want to continue yeah. to do. Yeah. Because we need that passion and that energy that you had putting into those early centers that mm. influence, as you said, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people yeah. with new possibilities. Yes, absolutely. That we may not have ever heard about before yeah. if these centers didn't exist. That's right. Or, or even something like Burning Man, the Burning yeah. Man Festival I went a few years ago. And uh, it's very holistic in a lot of ways. Of course, mm. it's the world's greatest party in other respects. And on other I've respects, been there. I it's it, very but, holistic. But I couldn't do that every day. No, <laughs> but you know, the way people, some people, people criticize people from the corporate world from go off the, the place for having people from major corporations mm. like Google, etc. There. But for those people, for a significant or important part of American capitalism, mm. to be exposed to a different approach to the economy, the gift economy there, yeah. yes. um, so where there's nothing, there's nothing sold, there's nothing bartered. It's a mm. pure gift economy. Mm. I think you know it's pioneering different, more economic models of how mm. we can be together. So I think that's our creative task now: is to pioneer different models uh, in all in the whole spectrum of human endeavor. No, I like that. I totally agree. And if we could pioneer near those new models with the esoteric traditions that yeah. you're a student of, yeah, that's right. then we'll get a mystical society yeah. to create a new world with. Yes, I mean, that's right. We've got to have a kind of foundation, mm -hmm. a spiritual foundation for most of us anyway. Well, talk uh, about the esoteric tradition because people yeah. are really unconscious about Gnosticism, Hermeticism, yes. alchemy, and it's the found. It, it is so interesting and um, intelligent. Yeah, you know, so well, you know, I'm a big fan of Tibetan Buddhism and yeah, Zen and shamanism and all of that. But for those of us who come from a European heritage, at yes. least, it's our own indigenous tradition, the Western mm -hmm. esoteric tradition. You know, you could, you'd say that it, it probably has its roots in ancient Alexandria, mm, around definitely. the Library of Alexandria 2,000, 2,300 years ago. Um, but, but it's had an enormous influence on Western culture, uh, e e whether we go back to the antiquity or whether we look at the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. um, we've remembered the art of the Renaissance. We've forgotten the philosophy of the Renaissance. But of course, the Renaissance man was the original whole person. Right. And if we look at the, for instance, the Platonic Academy of Marsilio Ficino in 15th century Florence, where the Renaissance, the rebirth, it brought mm -hmm. back all that ancient spiritual and philosophical wisdom mm -hmm. and seeded a lot of the perspectives all the way through the Renaissance. You can mm. experience these deeper uh, Neoplatonic, the, the renewal of Plato mm. in the, uh, or it, it happened in antiquity, but it was rediscovered in the Renaissance. Um, Gnosticism, yeah. so where, the, where it's not, the emphasis is not on faith, it's about a series of meditative and spiritual practices that can actually engender knowledge or gnosis of mm. higher spiritual worlds. Sure, no. And, and Hermeticism, you know, which has its roots with people remember the emerald tablet of Hermes yeah. Trismegistus, as above, so below. Mm. What does that mean? It's the concept of the human 
human being is a microcosm of the macrocosm, mm. that we're deeply embedded and integrated and related to the cosmos. Mm. And of course, this has been an understanding that many cultures have understood. But the Western esoteric tradition had to go underground many times because mm. it was persecuted by the church or wherever it might have been. And so we have to engage now in a kind of spiritual archaeology, digging it up again. And the Lapis magazine that you put out through the yeah. Open Center was a beautiful publication yeah, that yeah. talked specifically about yeah. that. Of course, many people can find um, different books about the esoteric traditions in the Yes, yes. So wrapping it all up, right. you here you've traveled the world. <laughs> no, you have. You've, done, have, you've, yeah. you've investigated the ancient mystical culture, the Tibetan, you know, the Machu Picchu, Inca yeah. cultures, and then you've studied the Western traditions. Mm -hmm. You've had your own experiences of deep, and you've started centers. You've created mm. uh, awakenings for other people. People right. now looking back, what's left? What's your? <laughs> what, what are you interested? in? What's well, the mystery I mean, now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wrote the book because I'm interested in doing that. In doing you what? You know, I'm interested in more the be, the writing, speaking angle. You uh -huh. know, for years I've been the director or the organizer yeah. or the producer or the introducer of thousands or hundreds of mm. other people and many many events. And now I'm sort of stepping forward from uh, behind the podium, as it were. Mm. I mean, yeah. this is me. This is my life. This is who I am. And what do you I want to tell say, my story? Yeah, and what do you so want to hope people get from your story? I hope they get encouragement and inspiration, you mm. know. You can set out with not very promise. I didn't grow up in promising no, circumstances. You, you catch with $40 uh, in your pocket <laughs> from Canada <laughs> to South America. 640 <laughs> but yeah. it still wasn't much. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I just hope that people will feel encouraged that they can do some comparable things, yeah. that it is meaningful, that we that the world does need this new way of looking at things for its mm. own renewal. Old and new, yeah. Um, and that we can find inspiration from some of these ancient traditions. And that if you have the just the sheer stick to itiveness, you know, the guts, the adventurous spirit, uh, you can really contribute to the transformation of our culture. Mm. And, and it's like you were finding this inner guidance that kept you going. For, even in the darkest of times, the, the coldest of mountains, the, yeah. the, there was something in you that yes, kept pulling you that's forward. that's right, and yes. And so I, I think that's what I became aware of. You know, I first really became aware of it on that trip down Route 66 <laughs> in Christmas of 1970. <laughs> it really was that archetypal American road trip. That became a spiritual journey. That was the first part of the Jewel yes. Highway. <laughs> well, maybe a hitchhiking before yes. that. But yes. I, I did uh, develop an inner sense, a, mm -hmm. an inner sense of, um, well, just direction. Mm -hmm. I could trust that I could trust my intuition and trust my mm -hmm. feelings, and that even if things weren't working out perfectly at that moment, there was something. I, and I was living in a fundamentally meaningful universe. Mm -hmm. And it, I think that's what got me through all of this. And, and you've written a beautiful book about <laughs> that. <laughs> it is a book of hope and. Um, wisdom but adventure and possibilities mm -hmm. and you know I'm, I'm really happy you wrote I'm happy I read it because I'm glad I didn't do those th I mean you did it for me <laughs> <laughs> you suffered yeah. for <laughs> on those adventures but I feel as if I actually do relive some of it with reading this book which is really, really a great feeling. Yes. Yeah, so, so could I mention the name of it? So yes, it's of the course. Uh, but if you go to the blog section. So, yeah. Thanks, Ralph White, The Jeweled Highway. Read it. Enjoy it. And get a sense of history that this conscious movement has evolved out of. I'm Alan Steinfeld for New Realities. Thanks for watching. If you want to find out more about me, go to my website, New Realities. It's a very enjoyable read, and it's about expansion of our consciousness and, and where that expansion, the foundations of that, you know. So you're, you're a pioneer. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Ralph okay. White, do you have a website or just the Yes. Oh, that, no. Ralph, Ralph, yes. Ralph White, just that, like the color. R-A-L-P-H, white like the color, ralphwhite.net. Mm -hmm. I am doing a series of speaking uh, engagements, uh, actually uh, both here in New York and on the West Coast, so you can find the that uh, on my website if you go to the blog section. So, yeah. Thanks, Ralph White, The Jeweled Highway. Read it, enjoy it, and get a sense of history that this conscious movement has evolved out of. I'm Alan Steinfeld for New Realities. Thanks for watching. If you want to find out more about me, go to my website, newrealities.com.
was great. That was a, that was a really nice entry. It was, it was like night and day with the one I did yesterday. But, 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 but